सर वी आर लाइव नाउ विथ ऑल योर परमिशन आई एम स्टार्टिंग इज सेशन ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन प्रेजेंट हेयर आई वेलकम ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट डॉक्टर्स ऑन टूडे सेशन लेट्स वेलकम टू डे स्पीकर विद ग्रेट ऑनर नन अदर देन डॉक्टर सी बी पाटिल सर सर इज अ कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट एट श्री शंकरा कैंसर हॉस्पिटल एंड रिसर्च सेंटर शंकरपुरम बैंगलोर एंड टीचिंग फैकल्टी एट डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ कार्डियोलॉजी एट मनीपाल हॉस्पिटल बैंगलोरू विजिटिंग कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट जी एम हेल्थ केयर उलसूर बैंगलोरु टूडे सर इज गोइंग टू डिस्कस ऑन अ टॉपिक आर्टीरियल सेप्टल डिफेक्ट बिफोर स्टार्टिंग दिस टॉपिक लेट मी टेल यू ओवर व्यू ऑफ द टॉपिक आर्टीरियल सेप्टल डिफेक्ट दैट इज ए एस डी इज अ कॉन्जेनाइटल हार्ट कंडीशन कैरेक्टराइज बाई अ होल इन दी वॉल सेप्टम बिटवीन दी हार्ट एंड अपर चेंबर थ्रू ऑफ एंड आर सिम्टोमेटिक दिस कंडीशन कैन लेट टू सीरियस कॉम्प्लिकेशन इफ लेफ्ट अनट्रीटेड to know more about this topic i would like to invite sir and hand over this session to sir over to you sir kindly proceed from here thank you good evening to all including the igcp staff for this opportunity to talk on atrial septal defect one of the important congenital heart anomaly uh, it is not moving slide is not moving sir just click on the screen and just then move click on the screen and yeah. then click no, side no, eye yeah. yeah thank you uh, so as you know this atrial septal defect is nothing but a communication between the left atrium to the right atrium again and uh, causing left to right shunt often and it is a most common congenital anomaly occurring in almost 25% of children during fetal life there is failure to close the communication between right and left atria and the and it has got a slow clinical progression and sometimes in 25 to 30% of adults ast may be newly diagnosed there are five types of atrial septal defect the commonest being of course pfo which can be present in 25% of adults also but uh, the next common being the second m type of ast which i am going to discuss today others rather primum ast sinus venosus ast and coronary sinus ast i am not going to discuss because that is a commonest anomaly small defects spontaneously close during childhood large defects may need either percutaneous closure surgery to prevent complications like stroke arrhythmias pulmonary arterial hypertension and uh, Uh, heart failure and uh, all the complications so epidemiology is its prevalence has increased in the last 50 years probably due to improved imaging modalities because ct mri all have been in vogue and more awareness among clinicians also to detect this uh, anomaly economical and geographical differences from countries to countries are also noted often seen in developed countries with high income of course that is not the complete truth and congenital heart disease as such is uh, nine uh, well, the infants are born out of 1000 live births and the incidence of asd as such is 1.6 per 1000 live births it is often sporadic may be associated with mendelian inheritance like uh, may be associated with down syndrome ellis van creveld syndrome treacher collins and thrombocytopenia absent radius turner syndrome and noonan syndrome maternal exposure to rubella and drugs like cocaine if the mother is taking alcohol antidepressants drugs and if she is suffering from diabetes the chances are more that the st child is born familial genetic disorders and conduction defects are also seen transcription factors uh, are important during atrial septation and of course it can be associated with holt oram syndrome otherwise called as heart hand syndrome which has got a congenital heart disease like ast in 58% vst in 28% associated dysrhythmias upper limb malformations of often hands in the form of a hypoplastic or absent thumb radii triphalangism phocomelia that is absent limb itself first degree heart block and second mst and with most often it is seen with a tbx5 gene mutations 
and NKX two to five gene mutations can have associated AST, tetralogy of fallow, dysrhythmias, AV blocks, and sudden cardiac deaths also. AST are often associated with VSTs. AST is an essential communication for survival in condition, congenital heart disease like tricuspid atresia, uh, total anomaly, the two, uh, great uh, transfusion of great uh, vessels, variants of uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, total anomalous pulmonary venous connections, tricuspid or pulmonary atresia as a part of hypoplastic right heart syndrome as a means of survival from primary lesion until a definite solution is provided for their survival. So this is an example of a baby born with a holt oram syndrome. You can see there's absent radii and uh, limbs are hypoplastic. So what are the types of ASTs? I told you initially, osteum secundum is the commonest, almost 80%. It is due to the increased reabsorption of septum primum at the roof and inability of septum secundum to uproot the osteum secundum, a defect in fossa valis. Female to male ratio is almost two is to one. In children with uh, Noonan's, Tetcher Collins, and uh, uh, thrombocytopenia absent radius, this can be seen. Osteum primum defect is again rare, 15%. Inability of septum primum to fuse with endocardial cushions, caudally, leads to this defect, which leads to uh, atrioventricular communications. It extends from inferior margin of fossa oil superiorly to AV walls inferiorly, and most often no ventricular involvement. But AV walls are abnormal in the form of a AML can be it, uh, that is anterior mitral leaflet can be split uh, cleft as well as the septal leaflet of the tricuspid wall can have a cleft with the two distinct wall orifices. So, so still rarer is a sinus venosus defect seen in five to six percent found within the mouth of the vena cava. <coughs> found within the mouth of the vena cava. And, uh, uh, and when SVC, in the SVC type of defect, and it uh, involves, it overrides the oval septum and drains to both right atrium and left atrium, often associated with right, right superior pulmonary vein draining into the SVC. Associated anomaly is that. And IVC type is still more rare, less than 1%, and at the mouth of IVC involving posterior inferior aspect of the atrium. And IVC overrides both atria and may be associated with right inferior pulmonary vein draining to IVC called as a scimitar syndrome. And that's called a scimitar vein. Coronary sinus type is a still almost less than 1%. A rarest defect, a hole in the wall between coronary sinus and left atria called as partial uh, or it could be complete unroofed coronary sinus communicating both atria often associated with persistent left SVC, which uh, is, this combination is called as a Ragib syndrome. So this is just to summarize, second MAST is the commonest, 75 to 80%, osteum primum. See, this is the so osteum second MAST, which I'm going to deal with more detail. This is osteum primum defect in the near the AV walls. And this is the sinus venosus defect, less than 5% almost. And uh, this is a coronary sinus defect. So associated anomalies with TST can be partial anomalies. I have told you pulmonary venous return can be there. Pulmonary valve stenosis can be associated. PST can be there. Pulmonary artery branch stenosis can be there. Persistent left superior vena cava can be there. And mitral wall prolapse and insufficiency can also be there. So the shunt direction and magnitude of blood flow depend on size of the defect, relative atrial pressures, which depends on compliance of both the ventricles, and relative vascular resistance of pulmonary and systemic circulation, which changes over time. As RA pressure is lower, most often than the LA pressure, often there is a left to right shunt, most often occurring in diastole itself. Small defects less than 10 millimeter size have small shunts without right sided chamber dilatation. Large, long standing shunts result in right atrial enlargement 
and right ventricular enlargement also. So that means if you find RA and RA, RV enlargement, most often it is a significant change. Myocardial stretch uh, occurs due to this and there is a maybe myocardial injury and impairment with time. If defect is large and QPQS being more than 1.5 is to 1, there is increased pulmonary blood flow. Uh, that leads to shear stress and there's a pulmonary endothelial cell activation. Growth factor release is there. Vasoconstrictors also are uh, secreted and uh, it leads to smooth muscle cell hypertrophy and leading to pulmonary vascular remodeling and thus there's a pulmonary arterial hypertension. Most often, increased pulmonary vascular resistance is rare and in hardly in 10, 5 to 10 percent, Eisenmenger syndrome can occur. pH most often increases with age and more common in women, often in sinus venous type of defects. So what physical signs may be asymptomatic, especially when defects are smaller than 5 millimeter. 5 to 10 millimeter size may present later in life, like almost uh, second or third decades. Patients with large defects may have repeated lower respiratory tract infections and failure to thrive. Dyspnea on exertion can be there. They can complain palpitations, fatigue, decreased function, functional capacity, and they also may also suffer from heart failure due, uh, due to overflow in the lungs. Atrial dysrhythmias can occur almost 10% by 40 years of age, 20% with advanced age, and atrial fibrillation is also known more than 50% in those aged more than 60 years wherein this defect is still persisting. Even whenever there's a transient ischemic attacks or thromboembolic stroke, it should rule out a PO4 or an AST. If Eisenmenger syndrome, you can also, the patients can develop cyanosis, they complain of fatigue, they can have congestive heart failure symptoms can occur. So now coming to the signs, RV volume or especially significant shunt lead to RV volume overload, left precordial budge, loud P2, wide fixed splitting of S2 because of the uh, fixed hangout interval, RV third heart sound can be there, and ejection systolic murmur can be heard in pulmonary area, and a short rumbling mid diastolic murmur is heard in tricuspid area. Whenever such murmur is there, again, it indicates that the uh, QPQS or the pulmonary circulation is almost more than 1.5 is to 1 QPQS ratio. Eisenmenger syndrome, if they already developed, there's a RV pressure overload, parasternal heave can be there, load palpable P2 and uh, even the P2 pulsatile uh, pulmonary artery can be felt and fixed splitting and a little narrow splitting, but fixed splitting is still persisting and TR murmur can be there in such individuals and in later stage even they can go in for a congestive heart failure also. So this is just to summarize, in the left second and third space you hear a fixed splitting and ejection stolic murmur and the tricuspid area, lower part of the left sternal border, you can hear a mid diastolic rumbling murmur. Coming to the evaluation, how to evaluate these patients? ECG shows right axis deviation, right atrial enlargement, and there can be incomplete RBBV. Whereas if there's already an Eisenmenger syndrome, there can be a both right atrial enlargement can be there, right ventricular hypertrophy can be there, RBBV will be there, definitely persisting. So these are the ECG changes and with the RV strain pattern. And systemic oxygen saturation also may be abnormal in Eisenmenger syndrome. And chest X-ray, right-sided chamber enlargement can be seen, which I'm going to show you. Pulmonary plethora and pH signs lie in the form of a narrowing of the pulmonary vessel arterioles, arteries can be seen. 2D echo with Doppler is diagnostic. Defect numbers, size, location, shunt direction can be visualized. And you can also see the right atrial enlargement, right ventricular enlargement. Paradoxical IVS motion can be there, which definitely suggests that it's a significant shunt is there. And PSI, PS systolic pressure, which can be made out from peak TRZ, and the mean and end diastolic PA pressure from PRZ, so which indicates the mean and the diastolic 
PA pressure also can be made out. Right and left ventricular function can be assessed. QPQS ratio from VTIs of pulmonary and aortic flow and their cross-sectional areas can be made out. This, so these are all the ways how you can assess the through the echocardiogram. And associated defects also can be made out in the echocardiogram. So this is the ECG in a typical hostem second MEST. You can see there's a partial RBBV is there and little uh, T wave are inverted V1 to V3 as a part of the RBBV. And this is a chest X-ray. You can see a MPA dilatation, RPA dilatation, RA enlargement, RV enlargement, all these things in this. And you can see some of the plethora. These are uh, nothing but end on views. Here also you can see. So these are the plethora, ind indicative of a increased pulmonary blood flow. And this is the 2D echo. You can see the septal defect here in the atrial septum. And you can see the color flow going from the left atrium towards the right side. And this is the PW Doppler indicative that and the diastolic flow is more in the ASD. So the evaluation, contrast echo helps when echo window is poor. And especially it helps in the LSVC and left, that is a left uh, superior vena cava and coronary sinus defects. When we inject in the left arm through the vein, the contrast, uh, the bubbles can be seen in the left atrium immediately. 3D echo, including right and left uh, interface. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, 3D echo, including right and left uh, end phase views for clear visualization of the uh, defects and unusual def multiple defects, fenestrated defect, their accurate size, location, and its relation to surrounding structures, rims of the surrounding structures, and also guides during interventions. And T is very helpful for evaluation during poor echo window, obese people, all these things. And especially it is helpful to detect SVC and IVC type of defects coronary sinus defects and helps during catheter interventions, definitely. Stent closure of sinus venous defect and surgical closure of sinus venous defects also, T is very important. And other defects closure in, in uh, OT, operation theaters. Fusion of T and fluoroscopy guides in device interventions also. Intracardiac echo is a newer addition and definitely helpful during interventions by the operator. Cardiac CT and MRI also are very helpful as comprehensive imaging of all the defects and follow-up echo, especially for sinus venous defects and other complications. And uh, this is just an example of a T. You can see the defect here very clearly. And, uh, and this is the 3D Echo in the AST, it allows better morphologic delineation of the AST and surrounding structures used for guiding also device closure during the procedure. Coming to the cardiac catheterization, usually its uh, use, use, usefulness is uh, very uh, low, but still in all patients, if there is a different, if there is a pulmonary artery hypertension, just to assess is it a pre-capillary or a post-capillary, if there is a left heart disease, and diagnosis of associated lesions in older patients with uh, uh, risk factors for coronary artery disease, if suspected, the treatment of CAD has to be proceeded. If there's a CAD already, it has to proceed. If it is significant CAD, it has to be proceeded before defect closure. So in those cases, definitely cardiac catheterization is very helpful. And closure is also uh, closure is useful when. Pulmonary vascular resistance is less than five wood units calculated by fixed principle while doing the cat and with decrease in the pH, especially when PASP is more than 40 millimeters of mercury by eco or right side chamber enlargement with oxygen. And if there's a decrease uh, uh, PVR, definitely it's an indication to close the defect. In some Balloon occlusion also may be needed just to study the hemodynamics, whether the closure is going to be effective in these people, and then only the closure can be done. Vasoreactive testing not done with uh, more than when the pulmonary vascular resistance is more than three wood units nowadays, it is not indicated. When PVR is more than five wood units, 
pH targeted, that is pandanatural hypertension targeted combination pharmacotherapy and follow up is required. If the PVR drops to less than five wood units and cubic ES is more than 1.5 is to one, then fenestrated therapy may have merits. If not, PVR more than five uh, wood units is a contraindication for the closure. And what are the current prospects? Defect closure before 25 years has excellent long-term prospects and normal survival. Morbidity increases with advanced stage at closure. Symptomatic benefits and improved quality of life are observed in all age groups. Hence, early diagnosis and early closure are very important before what symptoms develop. Avoid closure with important comorbidities like precapillary and postcapillary PAH with left heart disease. Better myocardial protection during surgery, arrhythmia management, and thromboprophylaxis have definitely improved the prognosis in these patients. Now, coming to the management, it has to be decided by a multidisciplinary congenital heart disease team. When right ventricular overload is suspected, timely closure, irrespective of age, preferably as much as possible, less than 40 years of age only. Whatever benefits, definitely they occur. Small defects, less than 5 millimeter may get closed within one year. Defects with symptoms are more than one centimeter size. QPQS more than 1.5 is to 1 with definite RARV enlargement if there are uh, lead to dysrhythmias and if there's an oxygen desaturation. They all need closure and they need a close monitoring and closure of the defects uh, when PVR is less than one third of the SVR and PA systolic pressure is less than 50% of the systolic systemic blood pressure. This you should uh, remember. Closure done during fluoroscopy uh, under the guidance of a fluoroscopy as well as transesophageal echocardiography guidance. Debate regarding balloon sizing for selection of device size is there. Sufficient and stable rims of at least four millimeters are necessary to support a stable device uh, implantation. In five to 10%, the rims are too small or floppy for stable deployment. Lot of evidence of the benefits of closure are already, already been seen and percutaneous closure only for suitable secondum defects. With improvements in device technology and deployment, complications are very less, almost just 7% like arrhythmias, erosion, AV blocks, uh, thromboembolism, pericardial effusion, rarely device embolization can be there. And usually following device deployment, they need antiplatelets for six months. Advantage of device closure, uh, definitely in the form of a avoidance of sternotomy and its pain, avoidance of CPB, that is cardiopulmonary bypass and its complications, short hospital stay and quick recovery. Large defects, as well as osteum primum type of defects, coronary sinus defects, uh, anomalous pulmonary venous connections, and other associated anomalies definitely need surgical closure. Closure is contraindicated if there's an advanced PUD. I told you more than five wood units is a contraindication and our left heart impairment if it is already there, dysfunction. Targeted pH pharmacological therapies, if the wood units is more than five wood units in the form of a endothelial receptor antagonist and PDE5, that is phosphodiesterase, five inhibitors, sometimes there may be even a need of a prostacycline subcutaneous therapy, either alone or in combination may be required if there is a severe pulmonary vascular, just more than five wood, wood units. These are the various devices used for AST closure, Amplaza septal occluder, Gore, Gore Helix septal occluder, and these are the shapes of these various devices, Cardio Seal and Biostar device. The recent addition is also there in the form of a Fugula Flex 2, Cardioform AST occluder, Cocoon septal occluder, Siraflex AST occluder, and Hyperion AST occluder. These are the new additions. And this is just to show you the steps through the EST. And this is the, uh, uh, the implantation device which has been screwed up. And here yeah. it is brought uh, here. And also there is a, and the left rim is in the, on the left atrial side. And uh, 
and you can see the right rim is on the right atrial side and it later unscrewed. And uh, if insufficient surrounding rims, multiple defects, large defects uh, versus currently available device, if cannot uh, they co close such a defect, excessively bulging atrial septal aneurysms, if they are there, then usually you can't uh, uh, deploy the device. Multiple defects sometimes are closed with two devices and avoiding interference with surrounding structures and conduction system while considering the rim support as well as and defect sizes. Recently, biodegradable occlusion devices have attracted interest, providing temporary scaffold for tissue endothelialization and controlled degradation over long follow-up. So recently, a sweet type of defects are all closed with covered stents without obstructing pulmonary venous flow. Even IVC defects have been closed with PD occluders, but standard treatment for them is still surgical closure for these defects. Post-device closure follow-up, check for residual shunt, unobstructed flow of pulmonary veins, coronary sinus and venae cavae. Proper functioning mitral and tricuspid valve has to be confirmed following device closure. Impact of closure on atrial fibrillation is controversial. Closure at young age less than 40 years may have some protection and paroxysmal AF may come down, but if there's already a persistent AF, it's uh, uh, coming down is a little uh, rare. So that is not an indication for uh, device closure, atrial fibrillation. So surgical closure, surgery needed in sinus venosus, ostium primum, coronary sinus ASDs, and of course, large ASDs, which are not amenable for device closure. Rarely emergency surgery for dislodged or embolized closure devices also needs. And median sternotomy and CPB are required, and small defects are closed with direct sutures, and larger ones by pericardial patch, dacron or goretex patches, and other artificial materials. Minimally invasive endoscopic surgeries and cardiopulmonary bypass through peripheral vessels and robotic assisted closed chest surgeries are also performed. Post-op stay of hardly four to five days and mortality is hardly less than 1% and low morbidity and excellent results. Post-op complications are less than 7%, often in the form of arrhythmias, post-pericardiotomy syndrome, all these things. Post-operative follow-up definitely is needed. Cardiomegaly on X-ray film and enlarged RV dimension unequal as well as the wide splitting of the S2 may persist for one to two years. ECG may typically demonstrate still RBVB. Atrial or nodal arrhythmias occur in seven to 20% of post-operative patients. Occasionally, six sinus syndrome, which occurs especially after the repair of a sinus venosus defect, may require antiarrhythmic drugs and pacemaker therapy or maybe both. And rarely some patients, especially adults, after the repair may require thromboprophylaxis at least for one year uh, to prevent thromboembolism, especially if there is a uh, paroxysmal AF or a persistent AF. Naturally, natural history is smaller defects, less than three millimeters, detected before three months of age, often gets closed within first year of life. If three to eight millimeters, 80% have a spontaneous closure before one and a half years of age, and more than 88 millimeters, they rarely close. Untreated significant defects have reduced life, they were reduced lifespan. And adult patients without closure fared worse in functional capacity, development of arrhythmias, heart failure, and overall survival. Mortality below 20 years of age is less than 1%, but rose progressively thereafter, and three-fourths of the patients dying by 50 years of age. Outcome was worse with ostium primum ESTs with high death rates and development of this thing. And hence, definitely, the treatment is required for all these uh, uh, anomalies. So what take-home message I can give to you is second ESTs are often sporadic, rarely familial and genetic. Syndromic association can occur. It's a defect at the region of fossa ovalis, size of which varies from small defects to large and symptoms uh, to large, and symptoms and signs also vary accordingly. When significant left to right shunt, its complications are repeated respiratory infections, lower respiratory tract infections, 
pulmonary arterial hypertension, arrhythmias, often supraventricular, heart failure, and very rarely strokes can occur. Evaluation includes signs of RARV, volume overload, development of pH detected by clinical examination, ECG, chest X-ray, echocardiogram, transesophageal echo, rarely and CT, MRI imaging also may be needed before the intervention. When defect persists beyond one to two years of age, needs early closure by devices or surgery to have a normal lifespan and to prevent future complications like severe pH and Eisenmenger syndrome, which occurs at later ages and in five to 10% of patients and often in females. Once severe pH and PV are that is pulmonary vascularity is more than five wood units. Closer is contraindicated and pH targeted therapy has to be given to prolong survival. Surgery with a patch closure required for very large defects, not amenable for device closure. Or, and also for ostium primum defects, sinus venosus and coronary sinus defects. Post intervention follow up one week, one month and yearly for five years, also needed by clinical, ECG and echocardiographic evaluation for any residual defect and rarely persistence of arrhythmias and maybe sometimes development of a pH and right and left ventricular function also needs to be assessed in these individuals. I think with this, I thank all of you for having uh, listened to my lecture patiently. If there are any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us and making this session informative one, sir. I thank definitely you. think this session knowledge is going to help all the participant doctors who have joined this session. Sir, we have received some questions, sir. If you allow, can I take this question with all your permission? Oh, definitely, definitely. Shall I first close question? my presentations? Yes, sir, you can. Sure. Yeah. The first question is from Dr. Agarwal. He is asking, what is the prognosis after the arterial septal defect closure <laughs> later in life? Uh, yeah. I told you, anytime the defect needs to be closed, because the later in the life, they can develop, if there is a significant defect, they can develop pulmonary arterial hypertension, they can develop heart failure, usually it Atrial arrhythmias are very common, including atrial fibrillation. I told you before age, 10% can develop atrial arrhythmias, like atrial fibrillation. More than uh, 60 years, almost more than 50%, they develop atrial arrhythmias. And you know, in atrial fibrillation, thromboembolic complications are very common. They can develop stroke and disabilities, all these things. Heart failure is common, dysrhythmias is common, and they will also have a functional capacity is impaired. The quality of life also is impaired. So this is the advantage if you close early at a very young age. Thank you so yeah, much, sir, for answering this question. I hope that Dr. Agarwal have received his answer. I can see one last question from Dr. Rishabh. He's asking, what is the long-term consequences of ASD? Uh, long-term co co consequences, if there is a significant DST, again, I told you it leads to complications like uh, uh, development of pH, heart failure, arrhythmias. Uh, later, uh, if there is a uh, right to left shunt, it can lead to Eisenmenger syndrome and it can also lead to heart failure. And in the very young age, usually they have got a repeated respiratory tract infection because of the uh, increased flow in the lungs. So that's how they suffer and they are failure to thrive. They can develop heart failure. If there's a large defect, even in infant, they can go into heart failure. And I told you through the defect, sometimes uh, even strokes can occur in less than 4% of people. Yeah. And there is one chart is there, question. Yes, sir, you are message addressed to meeting group. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir, for giving your valuable time and sharing your knowledge with us. As I can see, there is no more question. Uh, with all your permission, I am concluding this session, sir. Thank you so much for joining. Oh, definitely. Thank you, IJCP, for this opportunity. Thank, Thank you, sir. Uh, hope to see you again with different topics. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.